Thanksgiving is our opportunity to show God that He is first in our lives and as a reminder that God is the supplier of everything we have. It is also God's personal invitation to an outpouring of His blessing in our lives. At Christ Church, there are two easy ways to give online. First, you can text CC Mason to 77977. Click on the link you receive. You can also find this link by going to our website, ourchristchurch.com, and click on the Give button at the top of the page. Both of these options will send you to a page where you can set up a one-time gift or a recurring gift. Simply fill out your information and submit your gift. Giving is our opportunity to show God that He is first in our lives and as a reminder that God is the supplier of everything we have. It is also God's personal invitation to an outpouring of His blessing in our lives. At Christ Church, there are two easy ways to give online. First, you can text CC Mason to 77977. Click on the link you receive. You can also find this link by going to our website, ourchristchurch.com and click on the Give button at the top of the page. Both of these options will send you to a page where you can set up a one-time gift or a recurring gift. Simply fill out your information and submit your gift. Giving is our opportunity to show God that He is first in our lives and as a reminder that God is the supplier of everything we have. It is also God's personal invitation to an outpouring of His blessing in our lives. At Christ Church, there are two easy ways to give online. First, you can text CC Mason to 77977. Click on the link you receive. You can also find this link by going to our website, ourchristchurch.com and click on the Give button at the top of the page. 
Both of these options will send you to a page where you can set up a one-time gift or a recurring gift. Simply fill out your information and submit your gift.
Are you ready to have a real experience with real people in real time? Join us now for the CC Live Experience, where community begins now. Kids Live. My name is Miss Heather. Hi, everybody. I'm Miss Sean. Let's check in with Connect HQ today. The storm has caused some power surges, and one of them took down our communicator system. Maurice from the Tech and Tools Group is working on it but our communication system is down for the time being. So we have no way of communicating with each other? I guess not. What is that old-fashioned gadget over there? I think it's a phone. A phone? Phones don't look like that. It doesn't even have a screen. I do not like things that I don't recognize. like it knew we were talking about it. Answer it. I'm not going to touch that thing. You answer it. I'm not going to answer it. What if it's a stranger calling? Maybe it'll stop. See, probably just a wrong number. It looks like it's plugged in. So, all we have to do is unplug it. I'm not touching that thing. Well, I'm not going to touch it. Unplug it. No, you. Ah! Ah! Oh, hey, Maurice. Oh, just uh, working on the communicators. Everything's a little fuzzy because of the power surges. Can you unplug that thing? It's got us a little on edge. Just a phone. Nothing scary about a phone. <laughs> okay, that one got me a little bit. It's a message from the field office in Nashville. Howdy, HQ. This is my new friend, Emily. We've been sitting here shooting the breeze, and she was saying, well, why don't I let her tell you instead of me sitting here jawing like a toothless cougar chewing gum. Hey, y'all. I have to give a presentation for my entire class at school. And I'm terrified. Never talked in front of the whole class. What should I do? I'm scared. Sound like a real head scratcher. Why don't y'all see what you can do up there at Connect HQ and thank you kindly. She was brave enough to ask us her question. Surely we can help her find the courage to make her presentation. Do you think we can solve this one on our own? Just the two of us? We can always ask for help if we get stuck. And if this phone goes full-blown Twilight Zone, don't face it on your own. <laughs> ask for help. God has the courage. Thanks, Maurice. I'll go look for a Bible link. You can't leave me alone with this thing. It's just a phone. I guess you're right. I'll be right back. No, 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 no. Emily is afraid to speak in front of her class, so I'll do a verse search on the word afraid and see what comes up. Hmm. This one looks good. Psalm 56, 3. When I'm afraid, I put my trust in you. I think be afraid of Harper. It's just a phone. When I'm afraid, I put my trust in you. When I'm afraid, I put my trust in you. Hello? Ah! Nothing but a dial tone now. You said it was a raspy voice? I don't know what it wanted. It made a horrible monster noise. Hmm. Could be a local prankster or a hooligan just trying to get your goose. 
If they call again, I can trace the call and see what comes up. I tried really hard not to be afraid. Courage isn't about being unafraid. Everyone has fear, even me. I'm afraid of falling asleep on the bus and waking up in the bus barn. <sighs> but God gives me the courage to still ride the bus. That's a great point that could help Emily with her classroom fear. God gives me courage to face fear. Point link acquired. Glad I could help. Maurice, out. Any luck finding the first link? I think so. How about this? Psalm 56, 3. Psalm 56, 3. When I am afraid. When I am afraid. I put my trust in you. I put my trust in you. Great verse link. Nice and simple. The verse link is Psalm 56, 3. Verse link acquired. It's just a phone. Just a phone. Nothing to be afraid of. Calm down, Maurice will trace the call and figure out who it is. I'm really scared. Just like Esther. Who? Queen Esther from the Bible link I found. Here, why don't we watch this to keep our minds distracted while Maurice traces the call? It might help. Okay. Esther was the queen of Persia. Even her husband, King Xerxes, didn't know her secret. Esther was Jewish. Esther's uncle Mordecai worked at the palace and looked out for her. Xerxes' advisor, Haman, received a great reward. He was very proud. Everyone except Mordecai bowed down to him. Haman was insulted. He vowed to kill Mordecai and all the Jews. Haman told Xerxes that the Jews were dangerous and should die. Xerxes agreed and set a day to kill them. Mordecai was terrified and sent a message to Queen Esther. Change the king's mind, said Mordecai. If I go to him without his invitation, he can have me killed, Esther replied. Perhaps you are made queen just for this moment, said Mordecai. Esther bravely agreed to try. She went to the throne room. King Xerxes was amazed by her beauty and invited her in. Can we have dinner with Haman, she asked. Haman was building a big gallows in his backyard. He planned to hang Mordecai on it. Then the king's invitation arrived, so Haman went to the palace for dinner. A man wants to kill me and my people, the Jews, Esther told Xerxes. Kill the Jews, cried the king. That man is you, Haman. Guards, put him to death. So Haman was hanged on the gallows he'd built for Mordecai. Because of Esther, the Jews were saved. They celebrated with a great feast, which they observe to this day. Esther could have been killed for going to the king without an invitation, but she was brave. She knew God would give her courage no matter what. Thanks, Nick. Emily can have courage with her presentation, and I can have courage with this phone, even when we are afraid. Even so, I am not answering that thing again. I'll do it. Nick, it's Maurice. It's only Maurice. That's a relief. I traced the call. It's coming from inside Connect HQ. It's coming from inside Connect HQ. That's not a relief at all. Oh my gosh. Okay, the lights are off. There's nothing to be scared of. Okay, there's a stranger in the doorway. We can be scared now. When I'm afraid, I put my trust in you. So... I don't know who you are, but you don't scare us. God gives me courage. So... It's Mike. This whole time, it's just been Mike. Yeah, but why was he wailing like that? Oh! Oh! This storm is scary. <laughs> I've been calling. I know. It's not funny. It's just that we were scared for no reason. Come on. Let's get you back to bed, buddy. But soap. 
I know. I can't believe we were so scared of Mike. When we came face to face with the thing that scared us, we found out that it really wasn't that scary. Limit link uploaded. When we're scared, we can always remember this. God gives me courage to face fear. Point link uploaded. We can be brave like Esther. The Bible link is the brave and beautiful queen. Bible link uploaded. Let's say the verse together. Psalm 56, three. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. First link uploaded. We did it, just the two of us. I'll get it. Hello? Soup. You got soup. it, buddy. Mike is still looking for that soup. On it. Our point today is God gives me courage to face fear. That's a good point. This week, talk with your family about how you can show courage every day. That's right. Hey, have a great week. Bye. Bye. Good morning, good evening, and good afternoon. Coming back at you on the CC Students channel. Hey, if you haven't already subscribed, please go ahead and do that. It always helps us because that's where you get reoccurring content. Every time we post a video, you get notified and it gets you more in a deep relationship with God as we talk about different things that impact your life. Today, we're starting a new series I call In The Ring. I'm pretty excited about it. Forgot to mention, a little sponsor, Mountain Dew, Code Red. I don't know if I'm allowed to say this on a YouTube channel that we're sponsored, but we are. Nobody can tell me different. We might also be sponsored by Apple. Who knows? But what I want you guys to do this morning is I want you guys to think back to elementary school. Think back, think back just a couple years ago, not too many. And think back, remember your school bully in elementary school. <laughs> now for some of y'all, I just thrown you off and it might have put you in a traumatic experience, right? But seriously, think about that kid who was the school bully that was, and like everybody knew about it. The person who said mean things, who like done bully things like wet willies or like wedgies or whatever, you know, bullies. Or maybe they even like squared up against other people they wanted to fight. By the way, if you can't think of that person, you probably are that person. But in any case, I remember this kid clear as day. It was one of the school bullies that no matter what, you'd be out on the playground and this kid would come like a tormentor like no other. It was ridiculous. That kid's name was Andrew. I'm not gonna say Andrew's last name just in case you guys decide to social media look him up, but Andrew was a jerk. The dude straight up would be all types of mean to everybody. But Andrew wasn't like looking like your standard bully. This kid, he was super skinny, not tall at all, about the same height as me. But you just knew that he was the dude that was going to push on your insecurities and really go after you. And eight year old me probably got sad a time or two because of Andrew. And one day Andrew was messing with me and my friends and I specifically remember him coming up behind me and punching me. And it's not like he was punching me like in the face or in the, like fo face forward. He was just behind me and going like this. Over and over and over again, almost like poking. At some point I, I was just getting annoyed and I was just like, please stop. And we kept doing it, kept going, kept going. At this point, I broke. I mean, I literally broke down. I quickly turned around and I took him by his shirt and slammed him up against the wall. It was actually like this beam. And I slammed him up against this beam 
and I lifted him up over this beam, looked him dead in the eyes and said, don't touch me again. I turned around and I sat back down. So in this new series, I wanna talk about the fights that we have. And these fights, there aren't just against bullies like Andrew. These are fights that when we get into the ring against four kind of different groups of people or different like categories of people. So the thing about entering the ring is you know that you have a certain amount of time and to fight someone. You go up against them and you have to lay everything against the wall, everything against the line for these certain minutes. The bell rings and you start or, and, and it's over. So when you enter the ring, you have to lay everything out there. And these fights, they're they're super important. Maybe you hit them with the with the right, you hit them with the left hook, maybe you hit them with the one-two. But in any case, when we enter the ring, we're all out fighting. And I think that in life and in general, there are moments, there are times where we're fighting in the unlikely of circumstances against the unlikely of people. Now, I'm not just talking about physically fighting someone, but I have a question. What do you do when you're in a fight and the opponent isn't there? We aren't swinging punches, but we're fighting. That's for sure. Today, I want us to look at us fighting in the ring with God. Now, let's stop a minute. I, I said what I said. We're fighting with God. That sounds like a lofty task, more than I want to admit, but I'm sure, again, some of you are saying, why are you saying fighting with God? We don't want to picture these times where we fought with God because for a lot of us, when we fought with God, it's a traumatic experience, a life-changing scenario, and a difficulty uh, that's faced our path. For those times we've fought with God, we've asked tons of questions. What are you doing, God? Why me? What am I supposed to do? For, the, for Jacob, he had a similar moment. Jacob comes from the descendant of Abraham, and Abraham was a guy in the Bible that was promised a lot. We have a whole thing called the Abrahamic Covenant. What that means is God promised Abraham certain things to be delivered through, through him. And so Abraham was promised tons of different things, including that the lineage of God, meaning that all bloodline of God, that his people would start with Abraham and his family. And that would continue on and on and on and on. We see tons of people in the Bible that fall under the lineage of Abraham, starting with Abraham. God also was able to promise a land that was going to be plentiful unlike any other. So, for us to be able to see this, for us to be able to understand this, we have to be able to see where Jacob started. Now, Jacob is the grandson of Abraham, and he falls under the family tree. So, for the promises that occurred to Abraham, the similar promises occur for Jacob. So, we're in the story, we're in Genesis, and we're surrounded by this thing of Jacob and his brother Esau in a battle. They're kind of fighting, arguing with each other, kind of going back and forth. While all this is going on, Jacob is super struggling in his life. He's really struggling with his, with his disagreements, with his, with his quarrels with his brother, and he finds himself hurting a lot. And then that's where the story begins. We see Jacob wrestling with something. Let's see what this is. In Genesis 32, 24, it says this. And Jacob was left alone. A man and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket and Jacob's hip was put out of his joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go for the day has broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. 
But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the name of the place, saying, for I have seen God face to faith, face, and yet my life has been delivered. You see, Jacob in this story wasn't wrestling with a simple man. Jacob was wrestling with God. Let me back up. Wait a second. Take a breath. Jacob was wrestling with God. You see, Jacob was left here alone in this moment of honestly hurting and struggling with his brother. And in that moment... He starts to wrestle with God, a full-on, fledged, physical wrestle. To the point where Jacob is literally injured. Then he comes to the point of asking questions. We see, what is your name? Who are you? So not only was Jacob hurting during the fight, he, or not only was Jacob hurt during the fight, he was hurt before the bell even sounded. He was exhausted. He was tired from fighting his own brother. So then he gets thro- thrown into a own kind of battle with God. So my rhetorical question for you is how many of you are hurting right now? How many of you guys find yourself in a moment of being exhausted from fighting with your parents, fighting with your friends, fighting with yourself, fighting with your teachers, and at the end of the day, you don't want to find yourself wrestling with God? At the end of going through a painful experience, you are left to sit there and you don't want to ask the questions of why God, why me, what is going on? but you're forced to. And in those moments, it's tough. I know I found I have found my, mom, my time being in those moments of being left alone after hurting of something going through my life and recognizing, God, I don't wanna go through this right now with you. Just this week, I found myself literally laying on my floor, on the carpet, just laying there with not an answer in sight, with not feeling God, or not wanting to be in a fight with God. And and recently I was admitting to myself and others that I have gone through the season of depression. And the truth is I hate that that phrase, season of depression. Because seasons, they come and go, but sometimes I just feel like I'm trapped no matter what. So I was admitting to some people very close to me and I was arguing, they were arguing with me. You know, they seem to be saying, you know, life seems to be getting really hard for everybody right now. You just need to push through. Or I know things have been going down, but there's no reason to rush into words and calling it certain things. I sat there back and argued with these people that were close to me and kind of had said, like, I don't have the energy to do this. At the end of those, at the end of those moments, with those people, the, those people that are close to me, I, I, those conversations ended, and I moved on to be alone, sitting with God. And that's when the bell sounded, the fight had begun, and I, I wasn't sure what to do. I wasn't sure that I wanted to wrestle with God in that moment. I didn't want to move. I didn't want to do anything. But the truth is, when we're in these moments, God is going to be victorious no matter what, and we're going to be victorious in that. As long as we're in Him, we'll be victorious. God won, though, and eventually I started asking the questions, like, why God? Why me? Why now? I'm serving people. I'm leading a ministry. I can't be doing this right now. And God simply had taught me, it's not your plan. It's my plan. That's not what I wanted to hear, and I've heard that time and time again. I want the control, though. I want the power, and I want the plan to be in my own hands. You see, it's God's plan for our life, not ours. It's God's. And just like for Jacob, and just like for me, he is going to win every single time. God doesn't want you to lie to him. God doesn't want you to fluff things up. God doesn't want to act like things are amazing and everything is perfect. God wants the honesty. God wants the truth. God wants you to tell him when days are hard. God wants you to wrestle with him. 
Now, God doesn't want you to fight against him. There's a difference there. And hear me in saying this, it's okay to ask questions. It's okay to push against God. But what the difference is, is you're not fighting against him. You're fighting with him. What I mean by that is in Jacob's story and in my story, I knew at the end of the day that God's provisions for my life, God was going to bless my life. And I knew I had questions that I didn't answer to. And at the end of the day, he is going to provide those answers. As soon as I find myself in a position where I'm saying there's no way he has those answers, there's no way God is serving me, there's no way God wants anything to do with my life, that's when I'm not wrestling with God, I'm wrestling against him. And all of this is asking these hard questions is to help grow our faith. For, for Jacob, he was able to see God's face, wrestle with him, hear of God's promise, and that helped change his life. For me, I was able to wrestle with God and get to a better spot, a healthier spot, a fruitful spot, and that's going to help change me and help me to get better and better and help you all too. You see, for you, what is it? Where are you? Are you resistant on wrestling with God because you think it will hurt him? Because I promise you it won't. Are you not wanting to fight because you don't have the energy? I promise it's worth it. Do you not even believe in God in so much? How can you wrestle with him? How can you even wrestle with a God that you don't think exists? I'm gonna push you to say, continue to ask the questions, continue to try and look for God in these moments. You see, God has huge plans for our lives and sometimes that means entering the ring with him to help grow our faith. So this week, I want us to sit down and ask questions to God and be ready for answers. Truthfully, be ready for what's to come. Ask, why am I hurting right now? What am I doing with my life? God, are you even there? Ask the questions that most pertain to where you are in life. Ask a question that in your situation, with what you're going through, with ever what that might be. I know that it's a challenge. I know that it's hard. And I know that it's weird to sit down with God and ask these questions. But I ask that as you do that, sit down with your leaders during the week. Sit down with your parents during the week. Say, hey, I've been asking this question recently of God and we've been wrestling about it. Can you talk to me about this? Find someone that is a spiritual influence in your life to kind of talk about those things. Guys, remember to be Jesus this week, and I can't wait for you guys to continue the rest of In The Ring series. Like the video, comment about maybe a question that you have you're wrestling with God. I'd love to follow up with you about it. See you all soon. Thanks for tuning in. to have a real experience with real people in real time? Join us now for the CC Live Experience, where community begins now.
Aces Live, Joey Santos here, online pastor. So glad we get to worship together through technology, through CC Live, our global community, uh, right here in this place. You know, you're probably in different platforms uh, today, but no matter where you are, you can always connect with someone. Uh, so that's why we do this. We do because we want to connect. We want to build community right from where we are. Remember, every weekend we talk about this. Um, we have our Bible app. On the Bible app, you're going to search for, under events, you're going to search for Christ Church Mason, and you can get all the information about today's service. And you scroll down all the way to the bottom where you find CC Live Experience, and you're going to get access to the information that you need to have those conversations during the service. Remember, uh, right here we have a key and our code, this QNR code uh, is, your, is your access to everything CC Live. Uh, you can give through it, you can access our social media, you can get this information we're sharing with you. I mean, you got access to everything CC Live. We're going to live up here throughout the entire service. So you can just scan 
uh, with your, uh, the camera on your phone and you can get access to everything and just keep that in mind. We're very excited. After the message, uh, I'm gonna be back here. We're gonna celebrate community together. We're gonna give. We're gonna learn about, about more ways to connect. But I'm excited. I'm excited that today we get to do CC Live together. CC Live community begins right here. Well, hey there, CC Live. So excited to start a brand new series today with you, just simply titled Jesus Walks. Now, as we start this series, we want to reinforce the idea that Jesus is who he says he is. And not only is he who he says he is, but he does what he says he's going to do. And not only did he do it, but he did it as an example for you and I to follow, that Jesus was willing to come as fully human and fully God, to live completely as we live, to face all the things we face, and then show us how to live in that. And so for me, we can be confident in knowing that Jesus walked the way that he's going to call us to walk. Because he did it for us to know the example so we can show the world what it means to walk in a different way in the world in which we live. So if we're going to be those that go and make, not sit and take, if we're going to be disciple makers, not disciple takers, if we're going to be those kind of people, then we must walk as Jesus walked. We must face the things that Jesus faced, and he faced the things that we face, so we can have the confidence that we've got a Savior who is our example, who, who is able to show us how to live this life. And so today we're going to talk about the, the first way to walk like Jesus, and, and Jesus was tested. And he shows us the example of how to face the tests and the temptations of this world. A few years ago, I had the opportunity to hang out with who has now become a great friend. He was a mentor, uh, somebody that I've admired from afar for years, uh, but my friend Bob Russell. Now, some of you know the name Bob Russell, some of you don't. Uh, if you don't, let me tell you about Bob. Bob was the lead pastor at a church in Louisville, Kentucky called Southeast Christian Church. In fact, Bob helped grow that church by the will of God. God used Bob over the course of a, a, a few decades to grow a church from about 120 people to about 18,000 people when he retired. And now over the course of a couple more decades, the church has run in about 35,000 on multiple campuses and a huge online ministry. And Bob and I were sitting and we were talking, and I've heard him share this story in some other venues, but Bob said, uh, as they were kind of at the precipice, as they were starting to grow, and they were at this incredible rate of seeing people come to know Jesus, he said, I was in my office one afternoon and a woman showed up. He said, and I was by myself. He goes, I happened to be working late in the day, and she came in and knocked on the door and asked if she could talk to me, and she came in, and uh, he said she, he was sitting at his desk, and she sat across from him, and she shut the door. And he said, I got, I got a little uneasy. And, and he said, as she came in for counseling, he said she began to, um, to make advances at Bob. And at one point she looked at him and she said, Bob, nobody will ever have to know. Bob said, in that moment, I had a split second to make a decision. And that decision was, am I going to give in to temptation? Am I going to lose my influence? Am I going to lose my family? Am I going to lose my church? Am I going to lose my character? Am I going to lose my integrity? Or am I going to stand and fight? against the enemy. He said, I had a split second to figure it out. Thankfully, he chose to stand and fight against Satan. And he looked at her and he said, uh, I'm going to need you to get out because somebody will know. God will know. I will know. You will know. Uh, and he said, so I got up. I escorted her out of the building. I said, don't ever come back. He said, you know, it's funny. He goes, she never came back. He goes, but also, I don't remember ever having seen her before that moment. He said, and as he reflected back on that moment, he realized that, that Satan was actually testing him, tempting him in that moment because he knew that Bob was a threat to, to the kingdom of Satan by being a part of the kingdom of God. And, and it was very interesting because I hear that story and that's my greatest point of concern and my greatest point of protection as a pastor, especially the pastor here at, at Christ Church, is I always have this hyper-awareness towards where I know temptation will come. And just like Bob, that would be where my temptation would be too. That's why we have safeguards in place here at Christ Church. That's why, uh, ladies, I will not meet with you alone if there's nobody else in our building. 
I just won't do it. That's why we have windows on our doors so that at any point somebody can look in and just see what might be going on. I won't ride in cars with, uh, with people of the opposite sex that are not my wife or my daughter. I won't have lunches or dinners with, uh, with women that are not my wife or my, my daughters. Why do I do that? It's not because I don't trust you or I don't trust myself, but I don't trust Satan. Because I know that's where he wants to try to take me out, test me, tempt me, take me out. So let me ask you, what about you? Like, what is your greatest temptation? What is the thing that you can't seem to shake that Satan keeps throwing up in your face? What is that, that thing that you think you have the willpower to get past, but you always end up laying in your guilt and your shame after the fact? Maybe for you, it's a man or a woman that is not your spouse. Maybe for you, it's pornography. Maybe, maybe for you, it's a, a little extra money under the table that nobody has to know about. Maybe for you, it's, it's not telling the truth to get what you want. I don't know what it is for you. But here's what I want to do. I want to just take a moment. And I want you to pause, whether you're at a house campus, whether you're to the, the monkey bar location, uh, wherever you may be right now. I want you to pause for just a second. And I want, you to, I want you to respond to this question. What is your greatest temptation? What is the thing that Satan tests you the most with in your life? Take a few minutes to discuss and we'll be right back.
So I don't know what you just said, but here's what I know uh, is we all have temptation that Satan will use against you and me if, if we don't have a strategy to win that battle, if we don't have a way to combat that. So how many of us actually have that thing in our life? Well, all of us. And here's what I know. Satan will not leave you alone in that. So if, if we really want to combat it, here's the great news is Jesus and scripture actually give us the example how to deal with the test and temptation that come from Satan. In fact, let's see how Jesus walked the road of temptation to show us how to combat it. We're going to go over to Luke chapter 4. That's where we're going to spend the rest of our morning today, Luke chapter 4. And I want you to understand something right out of the gate before we dive into this set of scripture. This actually occurs right after Jesus' baptism. It's right after he gets baptized. It's right before he goes into full-time ministry. So understand that Satan usually does not attack when you're not a threat. Satan actually attacks when you're the greatest threat when he knows that maybe he could be defeated. So the account of Jesus' baptism, it teaches us something that, that Jesus actually is the Christ. And so the, the question is not whether or not he's the Messiah at this point. The question is what kind of Messiah is Jesus going to be? Jesus' contemporaries hope that he's going to be a political hero. That's what they hope. That's not the kind of Messiah we find here. Jesus is the, the personification of Israel in this moment, reliving their wilderness experience is what happens in Luke 4. In fact, Israel would last for 40 years in the wilderness. Jesus will go into 40 days in the wilderness. The battle's on. So as Jesus steps into his role as Messiah, he goes from the baptistry kind of to the frying pan because Satan becomes the adversary in this moment. With each temptation that we're going to see, Satan offers Jesus an easier route to this messianic ministry. But Jesus rejected them all. He, he didn't want to short circuit God's plan because that wasn't in God's plan. And, and Jesus was tempted in all the ways that we are. That's what we're going to see. Jesus is tempted in all the ways that you are, all the ways that I am. He's tempted in all the ways, which honestly should give us some hope. Here's why that's hopeful to me. That's why that's hopeful to you. He gets it. He gets what we go through. He understands our struggle. He offers us the model through his word to combat temptation. That's what I love about Jesus. Now understand, Satan is this powerful angel who, who apparently was ousted from heaven because of, his, because of his pride. He rules the dark forces of the world in which we live. He seeks to destroy uh, God's church. And on top of that, this looks like it's not a fair fight when we read the story at first. Because Jesus is in the wilderness, he's been weakened by 40 days of, of fasting, total fasting. Jesus is alone and Jesus is hungry. Now, physically, physically Jesus is empty, but understand something. On the surface, it looks like he's weak, but physically he may be hungry, but spiritually he's full. He's absolutely full. And too often our experience is the reverse. Man, we're physically full. We, we don't have any physical hunger, but we're spiritually empty. And we can't figure out why we cannot fight the battles that Satan throws at us. So let's go to verse 1 and 2 of Luke chapter 4. Let's pick up there for a moment. It says this, Then Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, he's full, right? Full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan River. He was led by the Spirit in the wilderness. He was led by the Spirit. Don't, don't miss that. The Spirit is with him where he was tempted by the devil for 40 days. Jesus ate nothing all that time, and he became very hungry, physically hungry. And the only way that Jesus can combat these temptations is to be spiritually full. I don't want you to miss that. If you are spiritually empty, you cannot fight the enemy. You don't have the nourishment that you need. There was no way he could have fought the enemy if he'd have been spiritually depleted. How often do we find ourselves spiritually empty, trying to fight completely depleted? How many times do you find yourself in a battle and you're like, I'm just worn out by the battle. I can't fight anymore. Well, usually that's because we don't have the right thing filling us up. Remember, Jesus may have been physically hungry, but he was full of the Holy Spirit. So let's unpack the three temptations that Jesus faces and that are ultimately the ones that we face. These three fall into most of the categories you and I are tempted. And here's the first one. Temptation number one, you may want to write this down, but it's the lust of the flesh. Lust of the flesh. But let's go back to the scripture, the, the back end of verse 2, going into verse 3 and 4. It says, Jesus ate nothing all that time, became very hungry. Verse 3, then the devil said to him, if you're the son of God, tell this stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus told him, no. Listen to what he says. The scriptures say people do not live by bread alone. 
So Jesus is called to, to feed himself through miraculous means. That's what Satan is saying. Go, just perform the miracle. Turn these stones to bread like you can do this. Now, on first sight, that doesn't seem sinful. The general public, they would have loved it, right? After all, they expected the Messiah to perform miracles and, and, and perform these wonders for the prosperity of the people, but it would have been a misuse of his divine power. It would have been a misuse of who Jesus was called to be. If Jesus starts using his power for selfish means at the beginning of this ministry, there is no way that he would have been able to go through the pain of the cross and death for us. Jesus understands that. It would have taken him out of the realm of human existence. It can no longer be said that he suffered like we do and that he used miraculous means to escape when you and I can't. If he'd have done that, his, his mission would have been done. In fact, in, in Deuteronomy 8, 3, that Jesus actually quotes here. Jesus quotes scripture. I, I, that's key. Don't miss that. The, the scripture that he quotes is actually Moses reminding Israel to humble themselves, rely on God, and not themselves. In fact, Moses was reminding them of God's provision of manna in the desert. Jesus' temptation is compared to the Israelites in the wilderness, right? But notice that Jesus is doing. He, he's, he's not giving some leadership mantra. He's not giving some uh, philosophy of the day from some philosopher. He quotes scripture. He may be empty on food, but he's full of the word. In fact, I love the first place that Jesus overcomes temptation. is temptation of the flesh. That lust of the flesh. See, in our culture, in my life, that's usually the first temptation I always have to overcome. That's usually the thing that's thrown in our face. And over the course of time, it's, it's more and more so thrown in our face that the lust of the flesh is fine. Just give in to whatever temptation comes your way, especially if it's of the flesh. Satan would love to take you and I out with the hungers of our flesh. However, when I'm locked into the word of God, when I'm in step with Jesus in prayer and action, the enemy actually loses his power in this area. I'll never forget, I, I was actually a new dad. My first daughter had been born, and, and she was still really, really little. She couldn't have been more than a year old at the most. My wife at the time, she was working, and, and so that, that gave my daughter and I some great time together on Saturdays especially. Every other Saturday, I got to spend all day with my daughter. Uh, but if you're a parent, you know this. I, I actually loved nap time, though, because, man, having a new baby is exhausting. And I remember on a particular Saturday, I laid my daughter down for a nap, and, and she could sleep. She was a sleeper. She'd sleep for a couple hours. And, and I remember I laid her down for a nap, and I, uh, I settled into the couch. I was going to watch a little college football. I uh, got my laptop, and uh, I was surfing the interwebs. And uh, I got to this place where I don't know if this has happened to you, but I, I started going down the rabbit hole of the Internet. And then it started to get into some places I probably shouldn't be on the internet. I was getting onto the fringes of those areas. And I was just a few clicks away from diving deep into some stuff I shouldn't be in. And in that moment, I had some decisions to make. And wouldn't you know it, that in that moment, my daughter, who usually sleeps really well, just begins to scream her head off. And for a split second, I thought, you know what? I'll just ignore it. She'll go back to sleep because I'm too enthralled and going into places I shouldn't be on the internet. But in that moment, it was like God like screamed into my soul, get up and go get your daughter and get out of this. What kind of father do you want to be? What kind of husband do you really want to be? And so I love, like in that moment, I was able to put down the laptop and walk away. I wish I could tell you that's happened every time in my life I've faced temptation. But in that moment, God gave me the out. And in that moment, he reminded me of scripture that I'd read just that, that morning of that he's the bread of life that sustains me, that he's the bread that I need to consume. So, so let's just take a quick pause. I want to ask you this question. How has the lust of the flesh shown up in your life? How's the lust of flesh shown up in your life? And how have you been able to fight it, if at all? Take a quick couple of minutes and we'll be right back.
Well, I, I'd love to say that I always get that right. That I always, I always do the right thing when I'm tempted in my flesh. But there have been times in my life where I thought I could live on just the bread alone of this world. But here's what I know. That bread never sustains. I'm always hungry after I have that bread. But the bread of life, Jesus Christ, that is where I get my sustaining ability to overcome the lust of the flesh. That's the only way it happens. And I love that Jesus combats each one of these temptations. Here's how he combats it. He doesn't, he doesn't physically fight it. He doesn't try to give some mantra. He gives scripture. He uses the offensive weapon that we're given when, when Paul talks about the, uh, the armor of God. The offensive weapon is the word of God. That when we know the word of God, that when we're entrenched in the word of God, that's how we combat temptation. Here's the second temptation. We see the temptation of the lust of the flesh. And now we see the temptation of stuff. Of things. Look at verse 5. Then the devil took him up and revealed to him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. He says, I'll give you the glory of these kingdoms and authority over them, the devil said, because they are mine to give to anyone I please. I'll give it all to you if you'll just worship me. And listen to Jesus' reply. Jesus replies, the scriptures say, you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. So Satan takes Jesus to the mountaintop. He shows him all the kingdoms. He shows him everything that, that he could have. And he says, all you have to do is bow down and worship me. That's it. Just bow down and worship me. Now, when we read that, Satan's request seems completely outrageous. Like Jesus is not going to worship Satan. But, but actually, it's more subtle than we realize. Because the word that Satan actually uses in the text is not a continual worshiping of him. It's a, hey, Jesus, if you just bow down one time to me, just once. You don't have to worship me with the rest of your life. Just one time. Just bow down one time to me. I'll give you all this. Isn't that how Satan works? Uh, this is what I know about Satan. He's kind of like a drug dealer. It, he, he says, you know what? I'll, I'll give you the first hit for free. By the way, we know the first hit's not really free. It always costs us something. That's just where he hooks you. He hooks you with that hit, that dopamine uh, of the, the stuff. He's like, I'm going to give you this if you just, just one time. Just one time. And then that leads you to the second and the third and the fourth. And all of a sudden it's costing you. It's costing you everything. The first bowing of the knee hooks you, but it's beyond that that it destroys you. Now understand something. Stuff in and of itself is not inherently bad. However, when stuff and the pursuit of stuff and the providing of stuff becomes more important than God alone, stuff's a problem. This is the one that gets me almost as much as the flesh, maybe more so. Because I like stuff. I, I, I think there's something in stuff that stuff promises me, but stuff never delivers ever. And that's satisfaction. I've never bought a thing, have a thing, uh, have, have gotten an Amazon Prime box that has fulfilled what I think it's going to fulfill. Uh, I've yet to have a thing provide for me what God gives me through his word and through his promises. And so Jesus has offered all the stuff, everything he could ever want all the kingdoms he could ever want. And yet he responds with scripture. And he literally says to Satan, you, you, must, you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. I'm not going to serve your stuff, Satan. I'm going to serve God. So let's take another quick pause. I want to ask you this. Does stuff have you or do you have stuff? And I'd like for you to explain to those around you how and why you feel that way. Do you have stuff or does stuff have you? Take a few minutes. We'll be right back.
So I, I don't know how you answer that, but I'm guessing if you're like me, sometimes stuff has you. And again, the way that we combat this is with the Word of God. We need to know the Word of God. We need to be entrenched in knowing what God tells us and how he, how he communicates to us, which the third temptation actually presses into that even harder. And this is why we need to know the Word of God. Verse 9, which temptation number 3 is pride. Temptation number 3 is pride. Go to verse 9. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem to the highest point of the temple. And he said, if you're the son of God, jump off. For the scriptures say, he will order his angels to protect and guard you, and they will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. And then Jesus responded, but the scriptures also say, you must not test the Lord your God. Now, it was a Jewish tradition that the Messiah would miraculously and spectacularly appear on top of the temple. Like right now, I'm standing on top of our building in Mason, overlooking uh, some of our property here. And Satan would have had Jesus like right here going, hey, just jump off this. If you jump off, the, man, God will send his angels to protect you. And, and so th- there was this messianic like tradition that they thought the Messiah was going to come on top of the temple first. Now, Jesus would have been immediately hailed as this popular Messiah. It would have saved a lot of time and a lot of messy ministry had he done this. The problem is that he would have been completely misunderstood and God's plan would have been completely derailed had he decided to do that. So Satan Satan now gets in the scripture quoting business with Jesus. I don't know if you caught it, but he quotes scripture, and and this is what he usually does. This is how he really gets into his usual deceit. In fact, he quotes Psalm 9111, but he leaves out the last phrase. He doesn't quote all of the scripture. He just quotes most of it. He intentionally omits it. And all God's ways certainly would not include self-seeking pride. When he says in all of God's ways, that, that would not have been self-seeking, uh, that would have been self-seeking pride if he would have succumbed to that moment. So to, to this extent, however, Satan is correct. God would send help and protection through his angels for Jesus. But isn't this just like Satan? That he, he'll take something that's good and twist it just enough to make you think that it's good, but it's really not. He makes us think we're doing right when we're actually not doing right. Like, have you, ever, have you ever had somebody actually quote scripture to you, but they just do it to make it fit the narrative that they want, not the narrative that God has called us to? I mean, think about Adam and Eve. This goes all the way back to the garden. Satan in that moment, he's been doing this since the beginning of time, since the fall of man. He's been distorting scripture just enough that we think it's true. He's been quoting parts of scripture to make us think that we can do all these things on our own, that we don't need Jesus. You know what? You, you don't, he didn't say really not to eat from the tree. Actually, he did. He didn't say that, that you, would, you would be miserable. You would actually know everything he knows. You would be better off. And yet, that's the lie. Remember, pride comes before the fall. Pride comes before the fall. So when we start saying things like, well, I can do this on my own. No, no you can't. I don't need anyone's help. Sure you do. I deserve whatever that thing is. Fill in the blank. That's where pride begins to creep in. And and honestly, this is the one that most of us Christians deal with on on a huge basis because we know just enough scripture sometimes to be dangerous instead of being disciples. So let me ask you this. We'll take one more break. And I want you really to discuss this, but where does the test of pride show up the most in your life? Is it when you want your way? Is it when you're, when you feel like you can do something on your own? Where does it creep in? And just discuss that with the people you're with for the next few moments, and we'll be right back.
So I, I don't know where pride hits you, but my guess is it's somewhere like what we just talked about. And, and even more so, when we try to fit Scripture into a narrative that God did not design it to be, that's when we get, that's when we get in trouble. That's when our pride gets us. However, notice Jesus' tactic, because Satan quotes Scripture. But Jesus quotes from Scripture again. He's like, whoa, 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 time out. If you're going to use my Father's words, use the complete message of my Father's words in the right context. And he does so, and he shuts Satan down. When you truly seek God in his word, not for your misuse, but for helping guide your missteps, it's amazing how God will protect us. So Jesus, in reality, is saying with his words, I will trust God, not test God. I trust he is who he says he is. I trust he'll do what he says he will do. I trust that who I am here is to do better to try to save those that are around me. I trust that his plans are greater than my hopes. That's what Jesus is saying. In fact, verse 13, after this moment, it says, when the devil had finished tempting Jesus, he left him until the next opportunity came. So what does this mean for you? Well, my guess is, is that if you're like me, temptation seems to always be around the next corner. It never comes at the most opportune time. In fact, it usually comes at the most inopportune time. Much like Jesus, you get baptized. You plug into ministry. You start doing what you feel like God is calling you to do. And you think that life is going to be roses. And and then then Satan shows up at the most inappropriate time, most inopportune time in your life, but the most opportune time for him. He's not going to hit you when you're not a threat. He's going to hit you when you're a threat to what he's trying to accomplish. And, And here's what I know. It, over, over my 40, almost 42 years of life, over my 24 years of ministry, here's what I know. is quoting scripture always puts Satan on the run. Jesus comes out of this tempting, he eats some food, and then he starts his earthly ministry. In fact, Jesus would face a lot of battles of the earthly persuasion. But he won't fight a battle like this with Satan until the most inopportune time, which is going to be in the Garden of Gethsemane, which we'll talk about on Good Friday. And here's what I know for you, and here's what I know for me. Satan is always looking to come when it's not opportune for us. He's always looking to take us out when it when we feel like we're at our best, he's gonna slap something into our life. But but understand this: the word of God is key. Over the course of the last few weeks, I can't tell you, it just feels like, man, the world's kind of crumbling around all over the place. It feels like people's lives are just in disarray, even more so than ever. And I, I don't know if that's part of the pandemic. I don't know if that's just life is being life. But every time I talk with somebody right now, it just seems like, man, there, there's death is happening too early or circumstances are getting crazy. And here's what's unbelievable to me. The people that are getting through these moments right now, the people that I've sat with are the people that they quote scripture. They know what God's word says and they lean into Jesus. And for people outside of Christ, they don't understand that. But for people that are, they know that their strength comes from the the bread of life that is Jesus. In fact, we want to do something for uh, the next next couple weeks, leading us into Easter and beyond, is we've we've actually developed a reading plan uh, for you that we want you to be a part of. We want you to go online. We want you to dive into the Word of God each and every day. We want you to be a part of that leading all the way up to Easter and the week after so that we can know the word of God, we can be in the word of God, we can understand how to walk like Jesus, we can fight temptation and the tests that come our way because we have the word of God etched in our hearts. And so today, that's my prayer for you. I don't know what your temptation is today. I, I don't know if it's, if it's uh, lust of the flesh. I don't know if it's more stuff or if it's the pride that you can do this on your own. But here's what I know. The only way we combat it is if we've got the word of God etched in our soul. Not for us to manipulate what we want, but for us to understand what God wants from us. So I would encourage you today, get into the word of God. We've got tools for you to do that. You'll hear more about that in the rest of the service today. But I wanna pray for us. And if you have a decision today and you wanna know Jesus today, you wanna know the one that gives us the example that understands right where we're at, then we wanna have that conversation with you today. You could start the first day of the rest of your eternity right here today. Talk to somebody in a chat room. Talk to somebody at your house campus. Talk to somebody at the Monkey Bar. But let me pray for us, and then we'll let you continue in worship today. Let's pray. Father, today, God, we thank you for being a God who, who understands us, who went through the things we've gone through so that, uh, so that we know we've got a Savior who, when he says that he's going to do what he says he's going to do, he does it. 
and that you're a savior because, because you truly live out the things that we've gone through. You've defeated sin, you've defeated death, you defeated lust, you defeated the temptation of stuff, you defeated the temptation of pride, you defeated the enemy who comes after us, that even though Satan is trying to take as many people down as possible, he knows he's already lost the war. So God, may we fight the battle that you've already won for us. May we, may we understand that we have a savior that understands what it is to fight temptation, to beat temptation, and to give us the power to do so. God, if there's any that doesn't know you today, God, I pray that you would give them life. You would give them something new. You would give them eternity. God, you would give them a hope and a passion to know the word of God so that they could combat the temptations and tests of this world. God, we love you. We give you the glory. We give you the honor. We give you the praise. And it's in the powerful name of Jesus. We pray all this. Amen. Though our sins are many and though we might walk in in here beat up and feeling like failure, Jesus purchased through his death complete forgiveness and a full cleansing. Not only in every sin paid for, but the ground of our standing before God and knowing we are loved by God is based on Jesus alone. Not only is every sin paid for, but the ground of our standing before God and knowing we are loved by God is based on Jesus alone. Not how good or how bad we were this week. Despite of our sin, in Jesus there is rest because we are forgiven and freed. There is also rest in Jesus through whatever valley, try, worry, or fear we are faced today. The bread and the cup are a reminder that if God gave us Jesus, the cost, costly gift of all, he will give us everything else we need. If God saved us and made us his children through Jesus, if he defeated evil and our sin problem, then we can trust he also has good plans for us and will carry us through what we are facing today. If he gave us Jesus in our sin, how much more will he take care of us and his children? Despite of our brokenness, burdens, and trials, there is rest in Jesus because we are loved and cared for. Communion is not a message about what we need to do, but what has been done for us. It's not a message about our ability to solve our problems, but God's ability and kindness to solve them. The gospel then frees us from carrying the weight of our word and then the weight of our spiritual walk in our shoulders because God is taking care of us, providing for us and at work for us. Rest in him today. Let's pray for communion. Father, thank you for this time and thank you for the promise that we can rest on you. That because your son, Jesus Christ, died on the cross for each one of us, we can be here today and we can lift up your name and we can praise you. So we want to bring this communion before you. We want to celebrate what you have already done in our lives and continue to do. That's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have children in the school, you know what a challenge this year has been educationally. But most of you that are able to watch this broadcast have been able to manage the transition to online school because you had access to a computer and internet for your child. Now, imagine living in a developing country where more than 30% of the population lives below the poverty line. And listen, there's widespread poverty and lack of opportunity and environmental issues like such as water shortages and soil erosion and deforestation and floods and droughts. 
all significant barriers, not only to life, but also education. Imagine navigating a pandemic and social distancing and virtually learning in that environment. Your students in the Dominican Republic have been learning virtually for nearly a year, many forced to learn via TV and radio since most families don't have a computer and internet access. Go Ministries is seeking to provide all children at the Go School with access to technology. Through virtual learning, our teachers have been and want to continue to be able to see their students, engage with them, and continue to provide them with quality Christian education, even in the midst of a global pandemic. Will you partner with us as we help Go continue to provide technology to their students at Go School in Santiago? Giving is our opportunity to show God that He is first in our lives and as a reminder that God is the supplier of everything we have. It is also God's personal invitation to an outpouring of His blessing in our lives. At Christ Church, there are two easy ways to give online. First, you can text CC Mason to 77977. Click on the link you receive. You can also find this link by going to our website, ourchristchurch.com, and click on the Give button at the top of the page. Both of these options will send you to a page where you can set up a one-time gift or a recurring gift. Simply fill out your information and submit your gift. Thank you so much for joining us today. Remember, right here, we're going to leave this up here for a second. Uh, more, if you need to access everything, CC Live, just scan with your phone uh, and you can access all our social media. You can give online, we can get information, you can connect with us. I encourage you to do that. We'll be back here next week, 9.50 a.m. Eastern Time, to celebrate what God continues to do in our lives throughout the week. Cannot wait to meet together as a global community right here at CC Live. Community begins right here. Jesus, there's no